The schedule of the Prophet ﷺ, a day in the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How is it that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to organize this very, very blessed life of his? We know that without a doubt and by far, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the single most accomplished man in the history of humanity. So how did his day go? Prior to Fajr, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, like all of us, would be sleeping. A sleep before which the Prophet ﷺ had already been up. He was in Qiyamul Layl prior to that, right? But after Qiyamul Layl, when there's only one sixth of the night left, the Prophet ﷺ would take that opportunity again to get a few more minutes of sleep within his night. So now he wakes up. And before he wakes up, he hears the adhan of, of Fajr. Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He makes the adhan. The Prophet ﷺ immediately after he gets up, what does he do? He gets the siwak and he starts to brush his teeth. Before he would go to sleep, والسلام, he would keep the siwak right next to him. He would place it and then as soon as he gets up, he brushes his teeth and then he makes the dua that all of us make when we wake up. After that, as he's hearing the adhan, he's done brushing his teeth, the Prophet ﷺ would now start to follow along with the Mu'addin as well and reply to the Mu'addin. Now the Prophet ﷺ, he makes another dua after the Adhan. But now he makes his wudu and perhaps if needed, depending on the night, of course this would be different from night to night. And then while he's still in his house, the Prophet ﷺ would pray two rak'ahs of Fajr and he would make them very very short so much so that the onlooker would say that did the Prophet ﷺ even read the Fatiha within this within these two rak'ahs or not that's how short those two rak'ahs would be okay getting prepared for Fajr then he exits the house again the Prophet ﷺ starts to make the dua of exiting the home then as he's walking towards the masjid, the Prophet ﷺ makes the dua that he had taught us to walk towards the masjid. Then when the Prophet ﷺ enters the masjid yet again, he makes another dua. Bilal recognizes that the Prophet ﷺ is here. Immediately, Bilal, he starts to make the iqama now. So now the Prophet ﷺ walks forward. And as I said, depending on the day, he would have made a ghusl. And depending on the day, he would have just done wudu. So now, sometimes the Prophet ﷺ would walk into the masjid and his hair are still wet from the, the, the ghusl that he had done. That the Prophet ﷺ was intimate with his spouse at night time. That even then, the Prophet ﷺ, he doesn't really, he's not bothered by this reality because intimacy is not a bad thing. And there's not no uh, shyness within this. The Prophet walks in with the water dripping from his head, alayhi salatu wasalam. And... Sometimes what would happen is even more than this. Sometimes he would walk into the masjid and he would have forgotten to make his ghusl. So when he walks in, he realizes before he starts to say Allahu Akbar that I forgot to make my ghusl, he would then go back home, make ghusl, come back out. Now it's very evident that the Prophet ﷺ needed to make ghusl. But even then the Prophet ﷺ, the shyness wouldn't stop him from following the truth. And that is that a person has to purify himself before he meets Allah. Rabbul Izzati wal Jalal. Now the Prophet ﷺ starts Salatul Fajr. Salatul Fajr for Rasulullah ﷺ is the longest, one of the longest prayers of the day. With the people, this is the single longest prayer. Even though it's only two rak'ahs, but this is the time that the Prophet ﷺ is going to read from 60 to 100 verses of the Qur'an. And uh, specifically in the day of Jumu'ah, the Prophet had a practice of reading Surah Al-Sijda and also Surah Al-Insan. So one rak'ah would be Surah Al-Sijda and the other one would be Surah Al-Insan. Every other day, it would be different practices. Then after he finishes his prayer, وسلم, he does more dhikr again. So now he does the adhkar that come after the salah. And uh, during the adhkar of the Prophet ﷺ, uh, the, the servants of the different families in Medina, they would bring 
uh, pots and jars to the Prophet ﷺ, as he's making dhikr, he would place his blessed hand within the jar and then they would walk away. This hadith is in uh, Musnad Ahmad and it's authentic. Now the day of the Prophet begins. He's done his adhkar after salah and uh, he's also done, uh, you know, he's done his prayer, he's woken up, he's ready. Now the Prophet ﷺ, takes this opportunity. This is one of the main portions of the day of the Prophet. He takes this opportunity and he gives a little bit of a lesson to the Sahaba. The Prophet ﷺ, his companions were like in a village around him. So every single moment that he had, he would pick out moments that he felt that the Sahaba would be willing to listen. He would give them a little bit of admonishment. He would give them uh, words of goodness. This would be one of those moments in the day of the Prophet ﷺ. Not very long, very brief, very concise. Then he would also take the opportunity uh, to ask about if there's anyone sick who's not here today. If there's anyone who has had someone that's died and they have a janazah. So he would say, is there anyone sick that I can go visit? Is there anyone who has died whose janazah I can go and pray upon? Because the people, the Sahaba would obviously feel very honored when the Prophet ﷺ would come and pray janazah uh, upon one of their deceased. Another thing that the Prophet ﷺ would do now is he would ask, is there someone there who had a dream at night time? If no one says that they had a dream, sometimes you'd say, I had a dream. And then he would tell his dream, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he would also interpret the dream. Remember, the dreams of the Prophet Sallallahu were also wahi. So he would take that opportunity to give them some more of the wahi. Then would get up and he would leave and meet all of his wives. One by one, he would go from door to door to each one of his wives. And this would make, make all of his wives feel special that even though it's not her day, the Prophet ﷺ is coming to meet me. He comes every day ﷺ, to all nine of them, two times a day. In addition to the one that he's going to have to spend time with uh, because of the fact that it's her day. Then after he's visited all of his wives, even though he really still needed to stay at the masjid, but he just left to say salam to everyone. Imagine that. Because everyone is getting up, the Prophet still has a majlis, a gathering at the masjid. But he takes the opportunity, the 5-10 minutes, 15 minutes to go visit everyone, then he comes back to the masjid again, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he sits uh, and does tahiyyatul masjid, and specifically in, in the rawda, and specifically in a pillar known as the pillar of the muhajiri. Then after that, the Prophet ﷺ sits with his back reclining towards the hujra, the house or the room of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. Then the Prophet ﷺ sits there and all of the Sahaba now start to come because this is the main gathering of the Prophet. Throughout his entire day, this is that one gathering that he almost regularly used to have. So this shows you that the Prophet would make himself available and everybody knew the time that the Prophet ﷺ would be available. So now the Prophet ﷺ sits. So similarly, in the gatherings of the Prophet ﷺ, depending on the day, there was more people sometimes, there was less people other times. If there was less people, then they would gather in front of the Prophet ﷺ in a circle. So the Prophet can focus on everyone. If there's a lot of people where the circle is not possible, so then they would line up in two lines before the Prophet. One to the right of the Prophet, one to the left of the Prophet ﷺ. Why? Well, because the person that's the questioner now is close enough to hear. And once he leaves, then the next person can come in very, very easily as well. And in this gathering and all other gatherings, the Prophet ﷺ had a very distinct way of teaching. Some of the ways would be that the Prophet ﷺ would ask a question. Instead of directly initiating the conversation, the Prophet ﷺ say, would say, should I not tell you of this issue? Do you want to hear about this? So if they say yes, now they're ready to listen. So then the Prophet ﷺ would speak. Sometimes the Prophet ﷺ say, should I even talk to you or not? In one incident, the Prophet ﷺ actually said, he's with the Sahaba, he said, I'm not sure, should I tell you a hadith or should I stay quiet? So they said, if you have something good to share with us, O Prophet of Allah, do so. And if it's otherwise, then Allah and His Messenger know best. And in, in some cases, the Prophet ﷺ would ask them a question, do you know such and such? Sometimes the Prophet ﷺ would take one 
sentence and repeat it two or three times because he can feel that someone may not be paying attention or he needs to be uh, it needs to be reiterated so the prophet ﷺ would do that three times this was a common habit of the prophet he would also use the prophet ﷺ would also use diagrams so the prophet ﷺ would draw the diagrams in the sand another thing would be intermittently the prophet ﷺ in his gathering would regularly be be making istighfar astaghfirullah wa atubu ilayh again and again so much so that the companions of the Prophet would say that would hear in one gathering of the Prophet him saying Astaghfirullah at least a hundred times. This would be one of those gatherings. At that time, some of the people would bring their children as well to get the du'as of the Prophet ﷺ. If someone had a newborn, they would bring the newborn for tahniq at this point as well. Some people that would have produce at this point, those people that would have dates, they would bring their dates asking the Prophet ﷺ to make du'a for these dates. So the Prophet ﷺ would make du'a for the dates of the people of Medina and he would make du'a for Medina and he would make du'a for the mud of Medina which is a measurement, like two hands full and he would make du'a also for the sa' of the people of Medina which is two handfuls times four and this would be also a moment where sometimes if he had delegations he would receive these delegations because the gathering was so regular, because this was such a beneficial gathering and because the daytime is a time where people trade and go to their workplaces. So, so Umar ibn Khattab would be one of those people that would have to go to work. What he would do is with his neighbor, he had made a deal, I work one day, you work one day. The days he misses, his neighbor comes and tells him what happened in the gathering. And sometimes people would bring food at this time as well. It's breakfast time. The Prophet ﷺ would honor everyone around him with that food. And on occasions when he's given the food the night before, like he's given, for example, a sheep or something, the Prophet ﷺ would have that entirely cooked, and in the morning he would serve it to all of his companions. ﷺ. There was one incident where uh, someone brought a complete sheep to Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, and he told her to cook it and prepare it with the meal and bread as well. The Prophet ﷺ used to have a very big plate, by the way. Uh, this is also reported in a hadith, so big that four people would have to carry this plate. The Prophet ﷺ asked that night for Aisha to prepare the dinner and then get it ready for everyone and then he brought it out the next morning in this gathering for everyone. This particular gathering didn't have any end times. It would be dependent because the Prophet ﷺ would try to solve everyone's problems, everyone's issues, answer everyone's questions. So sometimes it would be very long and sometimes it would be very short. But again, as the Prophet is finishing the gathering, in this gathering like all other gatherings of his, he makes the dua, Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik, Ashadu an la ilaha illa ant, astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Now it's time to go and visit people. From the, the day of the Prophet, you're gonna gather that he's always with the people. So he visits his family members, some of them. So he may go see his daughter, Fatima. He may go see his grandchildren, Al Hassan, Al Hussein. He may go see Umama. He may go see uh, any of these, depending on the day again. And he would go visit at this time also the sick people. And he would visit also the weak people, the destitute, the poor people. He would visit the old. He would visit even women, older women especially. Also his neighbors. He would visit the Arabs and the non-Arabs. Why? Because that society, they had some people who had migrated, some Persians had migrated. So there was one Persian man who lived close to the Prophet ﷺ. He had very good food he would make, okay? And the smell, the Persian food smell, would be all across the neighborhood. Now, in the process of walking around, obviously there was a certain adab of the Prophet that he would also practice in the process of walking around. One of the things was he would be a very fast walker wasallam. It's as if he is coming down a mountain and uh, in the street he would smile at everyone he would see. When he would see children, the Prophet ﷺ would wipe their faces of the children. And one of the things the Prophet ﷺ would do is he would say salam to people with his hand like this. To the men and also to the women. Whoever it may be, the Prophet ﷺ would stop to solve their, their, their problem and answer whatever they're asking the Prophet ﷺ. But as the duha time gets towards approximately around this time, 10 to 11, now the Prophet ﷺ, he goes back to the wife whose day it happens to be. In the morning he visited all of them. Now he goes to the wife whose day it happens to be. When he walks in the house, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he makes the dua of entering the house. He does the siwak. And 
Now the Prophet ﷺ, he says again, Assalamu alaikum, how are you, O oh, uh, oh family of mine? It's now again the time to get connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He spent time with the ummah now. Most of his morning has been spent with that. Now it's time to spend time with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So now he prays Salatul Duha. The bare minimum of Salatul Duha is two. The Prophet ﷺ would usually pray between four and eight. Now the Prophet ﷺ would eat a little bit if he hadn't already had food. Because remember some of the visitations, they would have already offered him food. But also sometimes when he would fa be fasting, considering the feelings of his, his wives, the Prophet ﷺ would break the fast if it was a voluntary fast. Meaning, uh, one time Aisha came to the Prophet ﷺ, she said that someone came and gave us a gift light last night, I saved some for you. So now she went out of her way to save food for the Prophet ﷺ. So the Prophet ﷺ broke his fast because of her feelings. ﷺ. And he ate from the food that Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha had saved for the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. This is again one of those moments in which the Prophet gets private time with his wife. And perhaps during this time, some of the women from the city, they come to meet the Prophet because they don't want to go in the morning majlis. So they come to the Prophet knocking his door in the presence of his wife. One of the hikmas behind this is because of the fact that the wife then hears the fatwa of the Prophet and then she reports it on. By the way, some, sometimes during this particular time, also very close companions of his would come visit. It's a very private time, like Umar ibn Khattab would come sometimes, Abu Bakr would come sometimes, uh, but this would be an open time for some of the Sahaba, very special ones, specifically Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, uh, these three would be regulars. And of course, Ali is family anyways. So Ali would obviously come as well. And other companions again who are very, very close to the Prophet ﷺ. In the house, the Prophet is the softest of people. The Prophet ﷺ is the most generous of people. The Prophet ﷺ laughs, he smiles. The Prophet ﷺ, as the hadith goes, the Prophet ﷺ is serving his family. But not always, meaning when he's at home. Those times during in which he happens to be home. So he's busy. Even when he's coming home, he's not resting and couching and... The Prophet ﷺ is taking care of his personal things. Like for example, if his thawb needs to be done, if the Prophet's shoes need to be done, this is the time when the Prophet ﷺ is doing all of these things. After he does these, again, the Prophet is a master at organizing his time. So he breaks things down over different days. He can't be doing everything every day because he also does qaylula and this qaylula he never misses. It would be that way that, that he would be able to energize himself to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala later on at night in Qiyamul Layl. This Qaylula, whether he's traveling, what, he would almost never miss this Qaylula. This is a nap that the Prophet ﷺ would take all the way till around Dhuhr time. So let's say around 11 till Dhuhr, the Prophet ﷺ is napping. By the way, during this time, the Prophet would only be with his wives or whilst he happens to be in Medina, he would go sometimes to Umm Sulaim's house. He started taking the mattress and, and she tried to take the sweat out of it. So the Prophet woke up while she's doing this. Okay? So the Prophet ﷺ said, What are you doing, Umm Sulaim? She said, I'm collecting your sweat, O Prophet of Allah ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ said, Good on you. And sometimes, because it would be very good scent. So they would use it as itar and they would also use it to do tabarruk as well. Then the Prophet would on Saturdays go to Quba. Even in Quba, while he's on a little bit of a travel, he would still do the Qaylula. This time he would do the Qaylula at Umm Haram's house, who's also a relative, a mahram of the Prophet. This is his day on, whilst he happens to be in Quba. Now, Dhuhr time of the Prophet ﷺ. During the Dhuhr time, again, he's napping. So when he hears Bilal, the Prophet ﷺ gets up. He answers the Mu'adhin as before Dhuhr. Or the four rakah as before Dhuhr. Then the Prophet ﷺ takes an, uh, this opportunity. Normally, they bring the grandchildren to the Prophet at this time, before Dhuhr. So the Prophet now plays a little bit with Hassan, a little bit with Hussein, a little bit with Umama, the daughter of Zainab. And then the Prophet ﷺ walks over and goes to the masjid and now he's uh, ready to pray. Uh, but he waits till Bilal tells him that it's time for prayer. Meaning that he's waiting for a couple of factors. The fact that it's really hot, on really hot days, they would delay the prayer a little bit. 
uh, also whether people got there or not. Okay, so these were factors the Prophet would factor in. So Bilal would kind of point at him, the Prophet ﷺ would then come in, and Bilal would then give the iqama. And now, occasionally, during Lohar time, he would bring Hassan along with him, or Hussein, or Umama. Sometimes Al Hassan or Al Hussein that would come with the Prophet ﷺ when he would go in sujood, they would go on top of the back of sujood. When is this happening? Lohar time. One time, one Sahabi he thought the sujood was so long, so he actually got up to see what's happening. So then he saw the Prophet is still in sujood. So then uh, later they asked the Prophet ﷺ, they said, Oh Prophet of Allah, we thought that something has happened or something has changed or you're getting wahi, so we actually got up to check. Uh, but he said, No, basically what happened was my son was riding me and I didn't want to let him stop riding until he's finished what he wanted to do. One of the things he would also do is sometimes with Umama, he would carry her in Salah. He would carry her along with him in Salah. So when he would be standing, he would be carrying her. When he would go into sujood or put her aside, and then he would carry her again. So this was one of the things that the Prophet ﷺ would do. Most of the times, Zuhur would be fairly short. Sometimes, the Prophet ﷺ would make Zuhur also very long. Normally, the Imam shouldn't make the Salah long, except for Fajr, of course. But if he knows everyone behind him is okay with making it long, then he's allowed to. After Dhuhr, again, he does his dhikr, he does all of the adhkar, and then he turns to the people. Normally, he's not going to be giving any talks or lectures or mawa'idah at this time. But if there's a special circumstance, the Prophet ﷺ takes this moment, gets on the member, and gives a small khutbah. For, for instance, one day, some very poor people had come, a delegation of very relatively poor people had come. So the Prophet ﷺ got out the member and he started encouraging the people to give sadaqah. But not always. He would then return back to his home. In his house, he would read the two rakahs after Dhuhr. Sometimes, by the way, he would keep himself in the masjid as well. Like, for example, one day a, a delegation had come to the Prophet ﷺ, and that was the delegation of Abdu Qais. They are very unique people. They accepted Islam entirely willingly. Meaning, there was no da'wah that needed to be given to them. There was no armies that needed to be discharged to them. They chose to come and they accepted Islam. So this waft, they came at Dhuhr time. And they stayed with the Prophet ﷺ from Dhuhr all the way till Asr. This was one of those days in which the Prophet stayed in the masjid all the way till Asr. Sometimes the Prophet ﷺ, after this moment, uh, after a little bit of time with, uh, uh, in the masjid, again, Dhuhr is very flexible as you can see, Dif different things happening at different times. Sometimes the Prophet ﷺ would leave to uh, give fatawa. If someone has a specific personal concern, they want the Prophet to come. He's willing to go and meet the people. Occasionally, this would be a time to also break up uh, potential tribal feuds that, that could occur. So one of the things that happened was in Quba there was a tribal feud that had started, people started to fight. So the Prophet ﷺ said, let's go to Quba. And now Asr time comes. If he's at home, he hears the Adhan, he waits until people gather in the masjid, and then he goes to the masjid. Because one of the things the Prophet would encourage, before Asr, he would encourage to pray for raka'at. The Prophet ﷺ said, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have his mercy upon the person who prays before Asr, Four raka'at. So the Prophet ﷺ would give people some time to pray these four raka'at. Then he would go to the masjid and he would make the qira'a that he would do in Salatul Asr half of what he would do in Dhuhr. So it would be even shorter of a prayer because it's a very busy time for people. People need to go home, people have other things to do. For example, uh, nowadays people have to pick up kids from school, etc., other things. So the Prophet ﷺ would make this salat very, very short. And after Asr, his time is even shorter with the people now. And then he goes to his families. Now this is the second meeting with all of his wives. And sometimes the Prophet ﷺ would kiss each one of his wife as well, wives as well. And then he would finally go and he would go to the one whose day it happens to be. Then he would spend the rest of that time normally with this particular wife. And by the way, the Prophet ﷺ had a special practice which we are not allowed to practice. And that is after Asr, the Prophet ﷺ would pray two rakas. What had happened was, one day the Prophet was in the masjid throughout, from after Dhuhr till Asr. 
So on that day when Banu Abdul Qais came, the Prophet missed his sunnah after Dhuhr. So then he made up that sunnah after Asr. Normally you're not supposed to pray after Asr, but he would tell other people not to do it. Most of his Asr would be with the family now. Sometimes, in again very special circumstances, some people would invite the Prophet ﷺ for spe specific events. It would be very hard for the Prophet ﷺ to say no to people. Now the Adhan of Maghrib comes and he's with his wife in his house. Now he doesn't give the people too much time. Why? Because Maghrib time is very short. The Prophet ﷺ would say, go and pray two rak'ahs before Maghrib. The habit of the Sahaba also was, when the Adhan of Maghrib would go, immediately the Sahaba to Rasulullah Sallallahu they would all go to the different pillars, and they would go pray behind the pillars. Why? Because it's a sunnah to ensure that there's something in front of you that you're praying. So the Prophet Sallallahu would see all of the companions praying, and he would also pray his two rak'ahs before Maghrib, then he would come out, and he would pray uh, Maghrib right in the beginning time. Whereas Dhuhr, he's delaying it a bit, remember. Fajr, fairly in the beginning as well, sometimes late, there's different ahadith. And that's why the Hanafiya they say that it's better to pray Fajr a little bit later. Uh, other scholars like the Shafi'iyya they say, it's better to pray Fajr a little bit earlier. Maghrib, it would be right on time. The Prophet would make Salat al-Maghrib very, very short. Sometimes, occasionally, the Prophet would make it long as well. Pretty much all of the salawat, occasionally the Prophet ﷺ would make it long. Also because this shows you that it's permissible to make it long. So the Prophet would sometimes do things to let people know that it's okay, I'm making it shorter, but you can make this long as well. And after Maghrib, the Prophet would normally not speak to anyone. Why? Because now it's time for people to have their dinners, etc. It's already late, people are tired. But he would make one message clear at this time. Because it's dinner time, he didn't want to see people going hungry. So he would tell the companions at this time, if someone has food, then remember the food of two is enough for three. The food of three is enough for four. So take home with you someone to eat. So the poor companions, the Ahl al-Sufa, the other poor companions, they would have someone there for them to eat uh, in their houses. Uh, this was one of the few messages that the Prophet ﷺ would make at this particular time. In terms of his dinner, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, because he goes back to dinner as well. So his dinner is when is it happening? After maghrib. But sometimes before maghrib as well. And the prophet would just eat whatever was available. He wouldn't make a fuss about what the dinner would have to be. The prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would never mention a defect in the food. If he liked it, he would eat it. If he didn't like it, the prophet sallallahu would simply leave it. One of the sunnahs of the Prophet was that he would use three fingers alayhi salatu wasalam to eat. And another was he would say Bismillah before eating. Another was after eating the Prophet sallam would lick his fingers. Another was that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam after eating would wash his mouth. He liked to have a sweetener along with his food as well. Sallallahu alayhi wasallam. A nice sweet cold drink known as Nabith. Which would be prepared for him in the morning time for the dinner time. And then in the night time for the morning meal. So the Prophet ﷺ would like to have a nice cold drink along with his meal as well. Now the Isha time comes. The Adhan of Isha comes. And the Prophet ﷺ would not be in a hurry to pray Isha. Why? Because it's actually better to pray Isha late. One day the Prophet made it very very late. And he says this is the actual time of Isha. If it wasn't for the fact that it would be too difficult for you, I would actually pray it every night at this time. The Prophet would actually prefer to delay Isha a little bit. He would watch, or from his house, the Prophet ﷺ would see when people would gather, then the Prophet ﷺ would come out. If the people are not there, then the Prophet ﷺ would stay at home. Sometimes, even if the people are there, the Prophet ﷺ had something to do. So he would do that. And in one day, as I said, it became very, very late until the point that people started to fall asleep. So the Prophet came out, and then he prayed Isha, but to console them, he said, there's something special you've done. The special thing you've done is that there's not a single person in the world praying at this time except for you. And after Salah, normally the Prophet ﷺ would not like to speak. He didn't like sleeping before Isha and talking after Isha. The Prophet ﷺ waits for a minute. Behind the men, there are also women. He doesn't want the women to be seen by the men or the women to be intermingling with the men. So he gives the females a little bit of time 
they all get up and leave, then he gets up. Because once he gets up, all of the Sahaba also get up. And this also shows you a couple of other things, and that is that there was no artificial segregations in the time of the Prophet ﷺ. After that, he would go home to his wife, and he would pray the Sunnah of Isha. Remember, all of the Sunnah the Prophet prays at home. Sometimes, occasionally, he prays in the masjid, but most of the times he's praying his Sunnah at home. Then after that, he takes a moment, he speaks to his wife a little bit, and then sometimes again, after Isha, normally he doesn't like talking after Isha, but sometimes, special circumstances, he needs to speak to Abu Bakr, Umar, he needs to speak to Sa'ad ibn Ubadah, he needs to speak to some of the important companions of the Prophet ﷺ, so he does that at this particular time. And the Prophet ﷺ then walks out of the house so he doesn't bother his family. It's their time to go to sleep, of course, right? While he's walking out, he might be walking around town now as well, just to see everything. In his walk, he may hear some of the Sahaba reciting Qur'an. And the Prophet used to love hearing the Qur'an from other people. So if he hears the Sahabi reciting the Qur'an, he stops there. He hears a little bit of the Qur'an that is being recited in the, in the streets of Medina. And then he goes to the masjid and he prays a little bit of salah. And then he goes and enters his house again. And generally speaking, the Prophet wasallam's dress code in his nighttime would be very, very uh, minimal. So the Prophet ﷺ would wear an izar, cloth that you tie around your uh, bottom. And then he would slip into the, the bed with, with his wife. And then he would take again, he would put a siwak right next to his bed. Always the siwak would be right there because as soon as he wakes up, he wants to brush his teeth Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then he would read all of the adhkar of sleeping. Then he would start talking to his wife after he's done the adhkar of sleeping. And if he feels interested in getting intimate, this is the time that the Prophet ﷺ becomes intimate with his, with, his, with his spouse. And if the, his wife happens to be on her hayd, on her cycle, even then the Prophet ﷺ would become intimate. But obviously not intercourse. The Prophet ﷺ would ask the wife then to wear a cloth around her bottom part like an izar similar to that and then the Prophet ﷺ would do foreplay and the Prophet ﷺ would become intimate with his spouse at that point. This would also give her a message that even though I'm on Hayd, the Prophet ﷺ is still interested in me. For the most part, right after this, the Prophet ﷺ does his ghusl. Sometimes the Prophet ﷺ only does wudu, washes himself like it is the manner manners of a person to wash himself and then and then the Prophet ﷺ would go to sleep. So he would just suffice with the wudu, wash the private part, and go to sleep. And this would be sometimes. But most of the time, as I said, he would do the ghusl at this particular moment, and then he would go to sleep. So this means, normally the Prophet would take a shower after, before going to sleep. The Prophet ﷺ at around midnight, meaning half of the night, from Maghrib to Fajr, that's how you calculate the half. So around midnight, the Prophet ﷺ wakes up, and the Prophet ﷺ, of course, what does he do? Right next to his bed is a siwak, so he does his miswak, gets up, gets ready, and then he makes his wudu. If he needs to, of course, he'll make ghusl as well, but occasionally, most of the times he's already done his ghusl. Then the Prophet ﷺ prays, and he now starts to connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about this, the waking up, the, mid, the small portion of the night where you get up and you connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it, is, it has a greater impact on the heart of a person and it is better also in what you're going to be uttering and saying as well. Then sometimes before he gets into the tahajjud, he does a little bit of dhikr. Then he would start his qiyamul layl. His qiyamul layl would never go above 13 rak'at. Of course, 10 of them being the tahajjud and 3 being the witr. But he would make them very long, except the first two. Because the first true is so, or almost like a warm-up. So the Prophet ﷺ is getting ready for tahajjud now. He does the warm-up and he prays the two rak'ahs. Then he gets more intimate with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this spiritual intimacy. And the Prophet ﷺ uh, reads long rak'at, very, very long. And in this tahajjud, whenever the Prophet would read an ayah which would have something related to the rahmah of Allah, the Prophet ﷺ would ask of the Rahmah of Allah. Whenever he would, 
hear or read something related to the adab of Allah, the Prophet would seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from his punishment. Whenever he would read something that was related to the uh, that was talking about the glory of Allah, then the Prophet would glorify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the midst of his qira'ah. And make the raka'at a very few. Most of the times only eight. Sometimes if he wanted to make it make more raka'at, then he would do ten raka'at of tahajjud and three raka'at of, of witr. In this particular salah, he would make the ruku' as long as the recital. And then he would make the sujood also in a similar way almost just as long. When the sixth of the night is left, now the Prophet ﷺ retrieves back to the bed. Because the best way to do your Qiyamul Layl is wait till the middle of the night, pray for a little while. When the sixth of the night is left, then you go back to sleep. This is what the Prophet called the Qiyam of Dawood And then the Prophet ﷺ would go back to sleep. But before he would go to sleep, for the witr, the Prophet would wake up his wife. For the Qiyam, the Prophet ﷺ lets his wife sleep. But when the witr time comes, he wakes up his wife and tells the wife to also pray with the Prophet ﷺ because witr is a very, very emphatic sunnah. According to the Shafi'iyah and according to others, it's even considered necessary. Okay? And then the Prophet ﷺ would go to sleep, wake up when the adhan would happen. He would pray the two raka'as and head to the next morning and then the next day of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would come and continue. I ask Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala to send salutations upon our beloved Messenger Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam.